started this evening we got a lot a lot to cover and I want to make sure we have time for question and answers so uh, this is a, a pardon yes it's on just a lot of information tonight so all right so tonight we're going to talk about disease prevention and healthy aging so it's really two separate topics in one discussion so we're we've talked about heart disease and cancer in the first week and the third and fourth week and fifth week. Uh, so this is kind of a, a, a review, but because heart disease and cancer are going to affect half of us, just we need to hear this, a few of these points one more time. So you should understand now that preventing heart disease is all about preventing this cholesterol plaque deposition. But I hope you've heard that it's not your high cholesterol that does that. High cholesterol contributes to that. It's how much inflammation you make in response to those cholesterol deposits. A little bit of cholesterol is not going to hurt anything. But if you get a big inflammatory response to that cholesterol because you're inflamed, because you have visceral fat, or because you have diabetes, or you have hypertension, or other reasons, a high C-reactive protein, other reasons that you know you're inflamed, then you're going to tend to make more of this plaque and it's going to become a problem for heart disease. Okay, so we talked about how, you know, depending on where the blood vessel gets plugged up, it's a small heart attack that you just thought you had heartburn one night, or up higher, it's a major heart attack that takes your life. If it blocks a big artery, and it kills enough muscle, then you don't survive it. And we talked about the root cause of this, but one of the root causes of this is a lack of nitric oxide production. So the blood vessels don't dilate because you don't get enough nitric oxide to make them dilate. And we've talked a lot about the diet that does that. We've talked about visceral fat that does that. I've mentioned that alcohol will do that. Alcohol will block the production of nitric oxide. Lack of activity will block your nitric oxide production so you're not making as much, you're not getting as much blood flow to the arteries and to the heart. And we talked a little bit about um, nitric oxide and I just wanted, I think I showed you this slide before, but just wanted to remind men especially how nitric oxide, you have to make some nitric oxide or the Cialis and Viagra don't work at all. So this is, this is just kind of illustrating straighting this point here. So these little blue dots are the nitric oxide molecules. You have, you have, uh, you have molecules that, that eliminate the nitric oxide that's just natural you know, uh, balance in the body, the, the pro and the con we talked about, balance and harmony. 
everywhere in, the, in nature, and this is an example. You make something and you, you can't make this forever, so you have to have a way to recycle it. Well, Cialis and Viagra work by blocking that enzyme. It just puts a little blocking point there so it can't swell up the nitric oxide. So it allows you to have more nitric oxide for longer periods of time. So if you're making fair nitric oxide, then Cialis and Viagra is going to work. If you're making no nitric oxide, it won't work. And some men have no luck with Cialis or Viagra. Okay, then we talked about the primary risk factors for heart disease. So these are the, the, five, the five most important risk factors. Uh, and the point here is that these are almost all lifestyle related, except for family history. You can't do much about your family history. But these other ones definitely have a lifestyle link. But there are secondary risk factors too. So when, when you come in the office complaining of chest pain or shortness of breath, we go down through this list, you have these conditions, and the more of these to have, the more concerned we are about what's happening with your heart. But then there are secondary risk factors that I think get overlooked a lot. One is a high C-reactive protein. Um, and the way you lower that inflammation and, raise the, uh, and lower the C-reactive protein is by weight loss. You lose that belly fat uh, with a plant-based diet and high-quality antioxidants. Uh, another risk factor for heart disease is sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is like somebody's suffocating you every night with a pillow. Every minute, every two minutes, you're not breathing. So your adrenaline levels go up and you're stressed all night long. So the blood pressure raises up and eventually the nitric oxide levels stop being elevated and sleep apnea can cause devastating consequences if it's first of all not recognized and secondly not treated appropriately. Uh, and then an elevated homocysteine level, which we talked about. Um, some of us, a lot of us have defects of this metabolism. I showed you kind of a, an in-depth uh, slide on this, I think, in week five. Um, I have a defect in this enzyme, so I don't clear that very well. It's only 60% effective in clearing this homocysteine, which injures the lining of your blood vessels. So the way I fix that is I take a B complex. Folic acid, B6 and B12 helps to overcome this defect. Both my parents have the same defect. Both of them had open heart surgeries in their 70s and 80s. So hopefully I'm circumventing that by acting on something that I can control. And many of you have the same thing. So what you do is you measure your homocysteine level. Have your doctor measure it. If it's above eight or nine, the, I think you probably have to take a B complex every day. That will drive it down. Um, and then, of course, being obese is a secondary risk factor for heart disease. Not a primary. It's not the most important. But if you're obese, you have more inflammation. Your C-reactive protein is going to measure high. Your nitric oxide level will be low. A type A personality is one that just makes a lot of adrenaline. And adrenaline is stressful. Uh, adrenaline causes your cortisol levels to go up until the adrenal glands say, we can't keep doing this. Do you remember what happens when the adrenal glands can't keep making cortisol? Where does it get the cortisol from? Cortisol is a steroid hormone. And if it can't, if it can't make it, what steroid hormones are your adrenal glands going to use to make cortisol? Anybody remember? Mm -hmm. Testosterone and estrogen and progesterone. So women, all of a sudden their PMS gets worse. All of a sudden a postmenopausal woman is having hot flashes again. All of a sudden a man's libido drops way down and his, his desire to go exercise and work out is just shot because this chronic stress causes you to deplete those steroid hormones. Uh, and then inactivity. Activity actually increases your production of nitric oxide, your cardiovascular fitness, getting your heart rate up. Uh, a, a good workout in the gym. And then we can't overlook uh, dental disease, bacteria that's uh, seeding uh, and causing more inflammation in your gums and it's going to your heart where there's more inflammation at the heart level. So those are all secondary causes. Then we talked about how do we prevent cancer. Um, and this was from week, uh, I think, one. So we just looked at some of the common cancers with the highest mortality rates, and we showed you some of the uh, dietary links and lifestyle links. Uh, another one specifically 
breast cancer for women's uh, a little bit more detail here. Things that increase your risk for breast cancer. Synthetic hormones, hormones that don't match your physiology. Pesticides, genetics uh, plays a role. Obesity definitely puts you at risk. Uh, the wrong diet, too much alcohol, too much tobacco, and a lack of exercise. All of these are risk factors for, uh, for breast cancer. And then how do you reduce your risk? Well, you avoid these risk factors. You try to do all you can to stay away from those things. And then you try to achieve an ideal body weight, which goes back to not being obese. Um, and then we're going to talk about the benefits of progesterone, natural progesterone, the progesterone you women all make. I'll show you why that could be helpful to reduce your risk. Testosterone can also reduce your risk of breast cancer. And then antioxidants play uh, probably a very small role in this. Okay, so uh, if I were to list the most important ways to reduce your risk of breast cancer, the first is avoid the risk factors. Second is probably progesterone, and third is an ideal body weight. And then fourth is testosterone. And we'll talk about that more. Uh, this is just a slide that's linking visceral fat. If you, if you have a big gut, these are the cancers you're more at risk of developing. Breast, prostate, uterine, and colon cancer. Uh, a big belly will increase your risk of bad estrogens. Um, estradiol is the good estrogen. It makes you ovulate, makes your skin soft and smooth. It does all the things that a woman wants to have. But if you gain belly fat and fat everywhere, you're going to make an estrogen called estrone. And that's a bad estrogen that's correlated or associated with breast cancer. So we don't want that. And those estrogens will also lower the nitric oxide levels, so more issues with blood pressure. Um, and then this visceral fat, this belly fat, increases all markers of inflammation, whether it's C-reactive protein. Um, there's, other, there's other inflammatory markers that the scientists will measure, like cytokines and interleukins and all of those. Uh, then we want to talk about the screening tests that we have for uh, cancer. That's, all the screening tests are about detecting cancer. And um, you think, well, why can't we screen for every cancer? And the reason we don't do that is one thing we have to do when we screen for cancer is we have to make it effective and not expensive. And most importantly, we don't want to cause more harm than good. We don't want to stir up more problems. So we used to uh, do a PSA every year for men for prostate cancer screening. And what was happening is a lot of men would have an elevated PSA and they would go right to a, a prostate biopsy. And the biopsy is, a, is kind of a blind stick. I mean, the prostate's this big and there's 12 areas of the prostate that we have to stick a needle in and take a sample of. But you can go, with that needle, you can go right past the cancer and not even touch it and miss it. Um, the other problem is we're going through the rectum. So the, the prostate's here and the rectum is here. The needle goes through the wall of the rectum and it's poking holes in the prostate. We try to keep that as clean as we can, but infections are common. So we can cause infections and we can hit nerves. So they said, that's too risky. We don't want to do that anymore. We, we don't think we should act on the PSA. We should do the rectal examination, which is no, no complications with that. Pretty straightforward. The problem is, is the prostate's this big and I can, I can feel that much of the prostate. That's not a very thorough assessment of the whole prostate. So I still like to do the PSA and I don't get too excited if it's high, we just follow it closer. So the point is, is we don't want to cause harm. I had a patient who had a chest x-ray before a colonoscopy. That was what this, this doctor requires. He was in his 80s. He had a little spot on the top of his liver that they saw on this x-ray. And they said, oh, we better, well, you better look at that. You, okay, now he was going through the VA system, which takes forever to get to the people he needs to go to. It was a year and a half of, we think you might have liver cancer, or, uh, a cancer on your kidney, so we want you to have a CAT scan, and then a PET scan, and then a biopsy. And they finally put him through all of this, and they said, yeah, we need to take that kidney out. So a year and a half later, he's thinking, I could have kidney cancer. They take the kidney out. And uh, 20 minutes later, the pathologist says, yeah, that little bump on the kidney, that was, that was a benign lesion. And the guy had a lot of pain from his surgical site. And now he's only got one kidney, and it doesn't function that well. 
that was all because we acted on a test that we thought was a problem. So we, we have to be really careful about these screening tests. So these are the screening tests that seem to have the lowest risk of complications with the highest yield of catching a problem early enough that we can do something about it without causing you know, those kind of complications. So you should be familiar with all those. Mammograms, I know they're not pleasant for women, but you should do those. Uh, now, some of you have been told by your gynecologist to get a mammogram starting at 40. That's because that's the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, ACOG. That, that's their recommendation. So the gynecologist will tell you to start at 40. The, American, or the United States Preventive Task Force Services start at 50. So there's different groups with different recommendations, and sometimes that confuses us and you guys as to when am I supposed to start these. Okay, but uh, these are the only one the cancers that we screen for because we can detect them early enough to make an impact without risking complications. Okay, and then immunizations. Um, there's a, yes? Uh, well, I think I think you should have a good skin, a thorough skin evaluation every year. Okay. Yeah, and um, if you're if you're somebody that burns easily or you've had some precancerous lesions as you get older, it's almost better to see a dermatologist because they'll find them really early and they can freeze them, and they're really good at detecting the precancerous things before it's a problem. Um, but if you ever see something, a mole or something change and you're not comfortable with it, see whoever you can right away. And if it looks suspicious, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll cut it out or we'll get you to the right person. So there's no reason not to do that? No. Okay, I, no. I misunderstood your video. Yeah, there's no reason not to do it. Yes. Pap smear test. Pap smear, yes. Just a 65, you don't need them after 65? Right. The, the chance of cervical cancer is low enough then that you're probably not going to have a problem with it. Now, if that, that's assuming that the last three pap smears have been completely normal. If they've been suspicious, then we go further with them. The mammogram, we start at 70, unless you're healthy. If you're really healthy and you said, okay, I'm 72, but I feel great and I, I, I'm doing really good, you probably ought to keep doing the mammograms. Because some 72-year-olds are like, boy, they're bad diabetes and bad emphysema and they've been in the, they're in the hospital five times a year and their quality of life is terrible, well then they probably don't want to go chase after a cancer. But if you're in relatively good shape at 70, after 70, I would still do the mammograms because we can pick those cancers up really early and intervene and usually people do okay with those. Okay, so there's all these vaccina vaccinations and um, they're constantly being updated. It's really hard to, to keep track of how to, how to catch up with them, how to do them. They, com they combine them into different uh, vaccines together. Uh, they have separate recommendations for children and for adults, and each vaccine has considerations for special populations. So you have to talk to your family doctor about this. You can also go to the CDC website to see what those recommendations are, and there's just it's a ton of information. And they'll show you the charts, and they get kind of confusing. Um, for some people, this is controversial, right? And I'm sure some of you have some reservations about vaccinations. Um, and there are many groups that are pretty vocal about their concern for every vaccine. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm not totally against vaccinations, but I'm not for every vaccine for everyone all the time. Children who are born 10 weeks early and they leave the hospital at 38 weeks when they should be born two weeks later. Uh, so they're still not, they're technically born, but they're still not even a term baby. They're getting the two month vaccines <coughs> before they were even a full term baby because they've been, they've you know, been alive for two months outside the, the uterus. I think that's a little extreme, but pediatricians, that's just what they do. Um, so there, people are, some people are pretty vocal about this. Um, some people are concerned about the autism rates in children that they might be linked to vaccines. Um, there can be significant uh, neurological consequences to some of these. Gardasil is one. That's the 
that prevents the human papillomavirus in, in teenagers who are sexually active. Uh, some of those viruses increase your risk for cervical cancer. There's two in particular in that strain of HPV that increases a woman's risk. Boys get the, the you know, men and boys get the, the genital warts, women get the warts, but then they get the risk for a heart or for a cancer of the cervix. So they, they really carry the risk. Um, and then the flu vaccines. I've, I've had people, I've had two patients get the flu vaccine and end up on a ventilator for two weeks and take a year to a year and a half to recover, actually three. Um, and these were healthy people in their late 50s, no problems. And they developed ascending paralysis called Guillain-Barre. So do you want to take that chance? Um, it really comes down to your belief system about how worried you are about succumbing to the flu or getting the flu. And, and then there's less than perfect success rates in preventing diseases. Um, you can still, sometimes you can still get these diseases. And there's no question that the pharmaceutical companies are profiting and Pfizer and Moderna and some of these others are really profiting. And they're often the ones that are funding the studies that say, see how good this is? So um, I think we just have to see the whole picture when we start thinking about this. And I'm not trying to talk anybody out of vaccinations or into vaccinations. I just try to show you what I've seen over the years. And then there is something to be said about our own inherent immunity. Uh, my wife uh, was tested positive for COVID five days ago. I was around a patient Saturday that uh, was t tested twice for COVID, didn't have COVID, uh, had pneumonia, I had my normal mask on, and then we did another test, found out he did have COVID. So I was partly, partially exposed. Um, yesterday I had a sore throat, today I had cold-like symptoms. Yesterday morning I could not catch my breath playing basketball. I was like, this is really odd. I thought for sure I had COVID. I was actually very disappointed that I tested negative today. <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to have it because I felt like I would do okay with it. I, and I wanted that natural immunity. So um, I don't know what I'm gonna do about these COVID tests because they're not fun. <laughs> but uh, I was trying to protect my colleagues and my patients so I got tested. Uh, so here's just a list of some of the vaccines. I'm not gonna read through this. This is just a reference for you. Okay, so this is really kind of my expertise, hormones. So I want to go over this with you and then try to give you a chance to talk, uh, ask questions about this. So when you talk about why you feel older and why you feel achy, these are the reasons why. Uh, it's not just hormones, it's impaired sleep, poor quality sleep, nutrition, lack of exercise, chronic stress, which means chronic cortisol overproduction, uh, when you lose cortisol, you start hurting more. Um, and then a decline in the effectiveness of the thyroid hormone, which is, a, it's not a steroid hormone, but we'll talk about it, that at the end. And then we have these other hormones that are steroids. This is a, this is kind of a, I guess a review slide, but I, I want to impress on your mind how all these steroids work together. So that molecule is cholesterol. This is DHEA, which you can take as a supplement. Here's progesterone. Here is testosterone and here is estrogen, estradiol, the good one. See, we're just, men and women are just one biochemical reaction different. I mean, there's big differences between those two hormones, but we can convert each one. And then cortisol, this is the stress hormone. Here's cortisone. Cortisol can make cortisone. This molecule looks a lot like prednisone. So you have the ability to make your own prednisone, which is really good. Here's the benefits. When you're stressed, you have increased cortisol. This is, these are like life-threatening, just heavy, acute stresses. That's perfect because when you start making more cortisol, you make cortisone and you get the prednisone effect. So when you have that because of stress, you have less pain, you have less inflammation and swelling, you increase your visceral fat, which isn't really what you want to do, but your body says, you're under a lot of stress. I don't even know if, I can't guarantee you're going to get calories for the next week, so we're going to store some calories in your, in your gut so you can burn those later. That works fine for six weeks, but six weeks of stress every day, and the adrenal glands say, whoops, sorry about that. The adrenal glands say, we just can't keep doing this. So your body says, you're making me stressed and I need this. This is keeping you alive. 
because you could be you know, trying to survive in the woods or maybe you're in a war situation. You gotta have this. You don't have to ovulate that month when you're, you know, your life is being threatened. Um, and who cares if your PMS is a little bit worse? You're trying to stay alive. So this is a huge issue. So what does the body do when it runs out of cortisol? Do you guys remember? Where does it, where does it make cortisol from? Do you, anybody remember? It says here, this molecule, we can make this, we can take this down and make cortisol. So some months your PMS is bad, other months it's not too bad. Now you know why, right? If you're having s several weeks of stress, a couple months of a lot of stress, not enough sleep and emotionally upset, your progesterone levels are going to be shuttled to make cortisol and your PMS is gonna feel worse. Uh, what's gonna happen to your cycles if you're under a lot of stress? You might skip a cycle, you might be late, right? Because you're, you're not making enough estrogen to, to cause ovulation. You could be postmenopausal. you could be 70 years old and say, my hot flashes were 20 years ago, haven't had one in years. And all of a sudden you start having hot flashes because the small amount of estrogen that you had as a 70 year old is now being used to make cortisol because of all the stress. And then the testosterone, this is the decline in libido. Soldiers come back from you know, war with like very low libido. I mean, these guys are at the peak of their reproductive years and they're just chronically fatigued and no libido. So this is the reason why. So when you've had this stress long enough, your cortisol levels drop. And the, tell, the, the kind of the take home signal for this is wired at night and tired in the morning. You can't shut your mind off and go to sleep and relax. And you can't get yourself moving in the morning. You're just exhausted. And when you have this cortisol insufficiency or adrenal fatigue, we call it, you'll have more pain, more inflammation, and you'll continue to gain weight around your belly. So both of these will cause weight gain. So we don't want that. So how do we fix this? Well, we have to fix the stress, right? We have to, cha we have to change this situation we're in, change the self-talk, because most of us really create our own stress. I'm really good at that. Like, because this happened, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen, and I've got myself all worked up about something that's just hours or days away from happening and usually doesn't. And we lose sleep over it and we create this stress. Okay, so this is showing you the hormones, how they should, how they peak. They go up in, in the late teens, they peak in the 20s, and they slowly come down. This is like typical for most of us, but this curve should not look like this. This curve should look like this, okay? So we decline faster because of our lifestyle and all the things that disrupt our, our hormones. That's why many of us in our 40s and 50s, we're starting to really feel like, I just don't wanna do anything. I hurt more, I have no desire to exercise or even walk, I just feel old. And it shouldn't look like this. So, um, why are our hormones more imbalanced than ever? Why does that happen? Well, here's a couple reasons. We have environmental exposures, toxins and chemicals. We have pesticides that we end up eating these foods. We have pollution in the air, we have plastics and parabens and all the things that go with this. And then on top of all that, we have food that is far removed from what nature has created for us, right? I mean, where is the, where's the, oops, gosh, where's the, uh, the pizza tree? Where do you grow that? Or what about these <laughs> wafers there? You know, how can you grow a donut in a garden? I mean, it doesn't happen. <laughs> so it's, it's got a lot, of, a lot of potential problems for us. Okay, and so this is just an example of environmental exposures. Um, and this is a study, uh, many of you are familiar with DDT, used to be used as a pesticide. Initially it was used in, in the military in World War II to help control malaria, typhus, uh, lice, and bubonic plague. So these guys got exposed to a lot of this stuff. Well, we found out that high exposures of this was really bad for us. Uh, and it was associated with an earlier age of menarche, so having periods at an earlier age and an increased risk of short, having a shortened menstrual cycle. That's just one example of one chemical that's no longer in circulation, affecting reproduction in women. Uh, here's another example of parabens um, in, found in different zones of the human breast. And where we find most of them are in the upper outer quadrant. And the thought was 
how do these, these are endocrine disruptors, they'll disrupt your, your hormones. How do they get there? Well, the thought was, if you're using um, uh, deodorants in the, in the armpit, th those often have parabens in them, and they will get sucked into the lymphatics and be found in the upper outer quadrant of the breast where most breast cancers are found. But then they found that um, seven out of 40 of women in this study weren't using uh, uh, deodorant. So maybe these were French women, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, they, were, they were getting this from some other source. And the source was uh, cosmetics on their face and their neck. Okay, so they were actually being absorbed and draining in the lymphatics and accumulating in the upper outer quadrant of the breast. So these are things like lotions and sun creams and moisturizers on the chest and upper arms. So we clearly know that there is a link between these products and what's in them, the endocrine disruptors and, and breast cancer. And then I mentioned atrazine uh, in the presentation. I, this is pretty fascinating to me because um, this was the, the most widely used herbicide since the 1959. Weed killer of choice for all these grains. Banned in Europe in 2003, but we still use it. We, 70 to 80 million uh, pounds a year is applied in the United States. It's a major contaminant of groundwater. It can travel 600 miles from the point that you apply it. It gets washed into the streams and it will go a long way and still have its effects. And in, in France, they found that it, was in the, it persisted in the groundwater for up to 15 years. So this is a powerful endocrine disruptor. Uh, and 60% of all of us are exposed to this every day. Now you think, okay, we're not the 60%. Well, actually, if you look at this map, um, this is like, we're pretty close here in Northeast Ohio to the highest levels of atrazine exposure. So this is the corn belt, right? Corn is, it's commonly used in corn. So we are exposed to this. And 600 miles from the point of application for, for 15 years or more means you're probably gonna be exposed to it. This is uh, a bunch of different studies uh, cited showing the direct toxicity of glyphosate. Glyphosate is found in Roundup. And this is, and these, are, these are the effects that we see uh, in parts per million. So very, very small amounts of, of glyphosate. Uh, this study showed human cell endocrine disruption, anti-androgenic, anti-testosterone, disrupts the aromatase inhibitors that convert testosterone to estrogen. And you can see anti-estrogenic DNA damage, uh, affects the placenta um, uh, umbilical cord in the embryo, cell toxic, multiple cell damage, total cell death, all of this suppresses mitochondrial respirations. They've got Parkinson's and all of these in very, very small concentrations. So this is another reason where, where these issues are coming from. This is very well documented. So this is a study uh, looking at pesticide mixtures and endocrine disruption and amphibian declines. And this, this was a study uh, looking at these endocrine disruptors in 0.1 part per billion. This is like one drop of water in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. That's how much we're talking about can affect uh, hormones. And in this study, they concluded that the urine of a farmer uh, in like Northeast Ohio or someplace where atrazine levels are high, on average, th their urine has 2,400 parts per billion, not 0.1, 2,400 parts per billion, okay, of some of these compounds. So what Dr. Hayes said is he estimated that that amount, 2,400 parts per billion, could effectively castrate almost three quarters of a million frogs with the diluted urine from that farmer. So we're, we're paying a heavy, heavy price but it's, it's not recognized by most people. Okay, so here's this glyphosate spray being sprayed on the fields. 650,000 tons in 2011. Uh, this is looking at the feminization of males, uh, lower non-toxic concentrations of Roundup, one part per million, not part per billion, one part per million, was the main endocrine disruption in testosterone and decreased it by 35%. Testosterone, 35% decrease by getting your hands on Roundup, spraying Roundup. 
um, breathing roundup as you're spraying it. Maybe, you know, not washing it off your hands after you, I mean, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have contact with it, but some of us are like, oh, it's just a chemical, I'll, I'll wash it later. Here's, uh, this is my nephew, Dylan. This was actually taken Saturday. Saturday, he's 21. Saturday, we went to Barbells. He wanted to work out. I said, I'll, I'll work out with you. Um, and I was amazed, because he's, he's big. <laughs> I was lifting the same weights he's, he was. And I, I thought, I was really proud of myself. I mean, the same weight, same reps. In fact, I said, Dylan, do this next and this next. And I said, okay, finally, we're gonna do skull crushers. I've got a 60 pound bar. He said, I can't do that. So he, he grabbed a 45 pound bar. I was feeling pretty good until we did chin ups and then he just, he just ripped me out. But here's the interesting thing. Dylan said, something is wrong with me. He goes, I think my testosterone level is low. And I'm thinking, who would think a 21 year old had low testosterone, right? But he said, something doesn't feel right. So I measured it and he is low normal. And like, what, there's no way I'm going to put him on testosterone. He, he doesn't need to start on that now. Uh, if he looks it, like that, you'd think he'd have high. You would. And I started talking to him. I said, Dylan, didn't you work for a pesticide company last summer in California? Weren't you spraying that stuff? Yep. I said, I think that's what's happened to you. The other problem is he's, he's a nocturnal animal. He's, he's up all night. He sleeps in the day, he's got a weird schedule, he's throwing his, bio, his circadian rhythm off. So there's a couple of reasons why I think he's low, but I think that that exposure to those pesticides really knocked him down. So I told him, you gotta sleep at night when it's dark out, and I'm, I'm not gonna give you testosterone, but I will give you DHEA to help you make your own testosterone naturally. Yes? Uh, I don't know how well it will work. It will clear out some of it. It'll, clear, it'll definitely clear out the, chlor uh, the chlorine, but I don't know if it gets those pesticide molecules or not. Probably doesn't. I mean, it might help it some, but probably not like what you would think. If, if you want to see the power of those water machines and getting these pesticides off, I gave you a link, I think, in that, in that uh, talk on, I think it was week five when we talked about water. It's uh, Pat Boone and Congen Water. If you just Google Pat Boone and Congen Water, K-A-N-G-E-N, -E he introduces it and then the guy demonstrates how well it washes these pesticides off. Yeah, that's, that's really good uh, to watch. Okay, so tips for managing your hormone levels. Uh, these are natural things to do. How do you balance your estrogen production? Well, you want to raise the good estrogen. Things like soy products will probably give you more estrogen. You don't want soy products if you're having PMS because PMS is too much estrogen. Black cohosh is believed by some women to help them with hot flashes. I don't think either of these really help with hot flashes. Um, you want to lower the bad estrogens, and you can do that by eating cruciferous vegetables. So the vegetables that stink. <laughs> Broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, they have a lot of sulfur in them. They help to get these out. They, could, they're very, they clean the liver and help you get these toxins out of your body, eliminate them through the, your bowel movements. Um, you can also buy a compound called indole 3 carbonyl that is heavily, it's, uh, it's found in these cruciferous vegetables. And you can take that as a supplement. So if you have PMS, you might be able to manage your PMS with just taking indole 3 carbonyl. It stinks because it comes from these foods. So just beware, it's not gonna smell good, but it, it can help and it's helped some of my patients. And then you wanna avoid these, these estrogen-like compounds that are harmful. So these are the things that you have to be careful of because all of these will give you these, fault, these uh, we call them xenoestrogens, they're false estrogens. <clears throat> How do you balance your testosterone production naturally without taking testosterone? Well, you minimize these exposures. You enhance your testosterone production by training hard and training fast. So you want your muscles to be sore for three or four days. Dylan was amazed that we would do a bench press, 12 reps until we couldn't go any further, and we'd go right into push-ups until we couldn't go any further. Then we go back, and we do that three or four times, and we're helping each other with those. But you train hard and you train fast. Um, you have to get good sleep. Deep sleep is when you make testosterone. 
is when you make these hormones. He's not doing that very well because he's, he's got a really weird cycle. Um, and then what interferes with deep sleep? Well, sleep apnea, swing shift work, Dylan's lifestyle, anxiety, pain, and stimulants. Caffeine will do this. Uh, and then avoiding alcohol. Alcohol will really lower a man's testosterone. And then they say that weekly sex increases testosterone. So sorry, women. <laughs> that may not be what you want to hear. Uh, don't tell your spouse that if you don't want to hear that. Uh, and then these, these vitamins also can help a little bit, but this isn't the answer. I mean, you can use these to supplement to help replenish cortisol, but that's not going to fix your low testosterone level. I, I think I told Dylan to take a B-complex B every day and some vitamin C, but that's not going to make a huge impact for him. How do you enhance your DHEA production? Because that's your adrenal glands. Um, you keep your cortisol levels in check by managing stress, getting good sleep, adequate exercise, and then taking some supplements. Uh, thyroid production. We'll talk about this in a minute on thyroid, but um, there are some things that will make your thyroid production not be optimal, and that is a high sugar diet, a high carb diet. Uh, that's exposure to mercury, lead, and cadmium. Um, I guess I can say it now because he's gone, but Dr. J, um, he, he, his thyroid level was kind of low. His VA doctor was telling him it was low. He's like, I wonder why it would be so low. I'm, I'm pre I feel pretty good. I'm pretty healthy. Well, he was a sniper in the Marines, and he wore a necklace with a bullet right here. <laughs> that bullet is right over his thyroid gland, and the bullet has lead in it. So I said, you probably ought to take that off. So he doesn't wear that anymore. Uh, so lead can interfere with that. Uh, there are two hormone or two elements that are really good for helping you make the active thyroid hormone T3, and that's selenium and zinc. So I try to supplement with these every day, not just for that reason, but because it's good for immunity in general. Okay, so here's the question. You know, I'm, I'm telling you all the benefits of hormones, and I'm showing you that I'm kind of leading up to the idea that we should take hormones, but we're all afraid of it. Or most of us are afraid of them because we've been told they're bad for us. They'll cause cancer, they'll cause blood clots and heart attacks. So why is that? Where did that come from? It came from this study in 2002, General American Medical Association. 16,000 women, menopausal, were placed on three different types of hormones. These are synthetic hormones. They're not, they're not the same hormones that your body makes. They're synthetic, they're not the same molecule. So Premarin is a synthetic estrogen. Provera is a synthetic progesterone. Prempro is a combination of Premarin and Provera. Uh, and we were given this to patients. So in this study, it was an eight-year study, let's, they said, let's see if we can control your menopausal symptoms with three, these three different hormones to see how women do. Uh, it was an eight-year study, but they ended it three years early because of the outcomes they were getting. They could not justify ethically continuing the study because in the PremPro group, now at the time they didn't know it was the PremPro group. This is later we figured this out. There's a big increased risk of breast cancer, increased risk of heart attacks, and an increased risk of stroke. They clearly saw bad things happening. And at the time they ended this study, women are having breast cancer, heart attacks, and strokes. We have to stop this. These hormones are bad. They're all bad. Don't give any more of these hormones. So patients were calling, what do I do with my hot flashes now? And we'd be like, I, I don't know what to tell you. You can't take this. And then some doctors would say, well, gosh, you can take Premarin for six months, but then you better stop it because it could be something bad. So for six months you feel okay and then you're miserable again. It wasn't until much later that we figured out it was Prempro, which is, it was really the bad one. These other two don't have that strong association with these bad outcomes. But the message got out, these hormones are bad, they'll cause bad things, don't ever take them. And every gynecologist, every endocrinologist, every family practitioner says, hormones are bad, don't use them. Well, these are synthetic hormones. So let me show you the, the difference. Synthetic hormones have molecules that are not identical to what your ovaries or your testicles make. Okay, so they're, they're, they're actually invented molecules. If you've invented something, you get a patent on it. If you've got a patent on something, you can make money off of that patent. So these three examples here, Premarin, Provera, and Prempro, 
These are drugs. These are pharmaceutical drugs that the pharmaceutical industry can make a lot of money on. Mm -hmm. That's why they're pushed. That's, and they're still on market. You can still be given Prempro. You should never take Prempro. That's, that's terrible. Now, bioidentical molecules are created from plants. That's, a, that's the starting point. And they can, they can be made in, in a laboratory. But when they're done, they look exactly, they're the same chemical compound as what we all make in our bodies. And since it's the same compound, there's nothing unique. There's no patent on that. There's no financial incentive. Nobody's going to talk about that because nobody's going to really make money on it. Okay, so let me show you the difference between structure. So this is benzene. Uh, this is a cancer-causing agent. It was in the lab when I was working at Ohio State in the nutrition lab. This is something you probably ate today or this last week. Very similar in structure, just a small chemical change. It's benzoic acid. It's a preservative. It's pretty harmless. This is another little change in that molecule that's actually very dangerous. It's called aniline. It's a poison. Okay, so you can see how different, just almost the same structure, a little change makes a big difference in your body and what your body does to it. So here we have the estrogen that all of us make. Women make 20 times more, about 20 times more of this than men do, but men need this molecule as well. That's what it is. When you take Premarin, you're taking a molecule that looks close to it, but can you see the difference? Like that's not on this molecule. Here's another molecule in Premarin that's not quite the same, pretty close, and the body says, I think I know what that is. I think that's supposed to keep my vaginal canal uh, moist. I think it's supposed to uh, help me with my, my breast development when I'm a teenager. It's supposed to help me uh, ovulate, but I'm not sure. I think that's what it does. Here is uh, another look at Premarin. It's actually, uh, and, and this, is the, this is the hormone that women need right here, the 17 beta estradiol. So it does have one of the hormones that you need. This is the key. But all of these others, this is the really bad one. That's, that's made in your fat cells. You don't want that. That's correlated with breast cancer. You're getting all of these other molecules that your body has never seen before. And you're getting them from the urine of a pregnant mare. So is that, does that make sense that that would be something you would want to take for your hot flashes? Why don't you just take this one? Or just turn on the fan. Or turn on the fan, <laughs> yes. So here's, here's some of the benefits of estrogen, all the things that they do for you. They're healthy for a man's prostate. <coughs> I have a man with prostate cancer. He can't take testosterone, but he can take estrogen, and it's driving his PSA down. It's healthy for his prostate. Okay, so it does all these things. So when you don't have it, it feels like menopause. When you have too much of it, it feels like PMS. I had somebody today, uh, an older, in her late 80s, had a hip fracture. I said, you've got osteoporosis. You've already cracked your spine a couple times. We've got to make your bones stronger. I'm going to put you on estradiol. She started taking it, and then she fell and broke her hip. Well, she, we hadn't restored her hip, we hadn't reversed her osteoporosis yet, broke her hip. Um, then she was having some vaginal bleeding <coughs> because she was taking too much estrogen that I'd given her, not enough progesterone to balance it. Gynecologist said, you got to stop that. That's making you bleed. That's bad. Why would he do that to you? Well, I did it to make her, her osteoporosis reverse, which it will do if you get enough and you don't have vaginal bleeding because you take progesterone, which she wouldn't take. So now I said, so what's your gynecologist going to do for your osteoporosis now? You broke one hip. You've cracked your spine a couple times. Ask him. What's, what's it going to do? Because this isn't going to fix anything. Um, you need estrogen. And she doesn't want to take the synthetic drugs that we use because they can be dangerous. So she's stuck. And I, there was no way I could talk her out of estrogen with progesterone and you won't bleed. She didn't believe me at this point. So I don't know what she's going to do. She'll probably break something else eventually. She may end up like my mother-in-law who fell, taking the trash out, and just totally shattered her, the head of her humerus and just, just splintered it in pieces. And when they tried to put an artificial joint in, the screws wouldn't hold because the bones were so brittle. Mm -hmm. So she now has nothing here, and her arm is fixed like this. She can't wipe herself. She can't go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. That's how she's living because her osteoporosis was so bad, 
and it wasn't treated. This is the best way to treat osteoporosis, and it was not done because most doctors don't know how to do this. So here's, here's the other benefits. You don't want to be in the normal range of estrogen. You always want to be in the high range where you were with your estradiol levels when you were in your 20s or 30s. That's where we're trying to target. So here is natural progesterone, which women make. Men don't need this because progesterone, it's, it's progestational. It's what keeps you pregnant once you get pregnant. If you didn't have this, your body would say, I see those cells growing. That looks like a tumor. We're going to get rid of it. And, that, and the cell, those cells are the baby. So if you don't make enough progesterone, you'll keep having miscarriages. That's why you have it. But you get other benefits from progesterone. It, it's a an natural anti-anxiety, natural antidepressant. And it, it's, it kind of is anti-breast cancer. It helps to kill breast cancer cells. This is Provera, which is synthetic. So you can see it's not the same molecule, right? Why put something that, that people are benefiting from financially that isn't, doesn't match your physiology in your body when you can take this one? And that's how you treat PMS. That's how you treat postpartum depression. Okay, so the progesterone is the hormone that makes you feel good, makes you feel happy. If you don't have progesterone, you're going to have more fluid retention, headaches, bloating, bleeding, and be more irritable right before a period. So that's PMS. So how do I treat PMS? I give women progesterone. And they take as much as they need to not, whoops, not have those symptoms. Uh, and it, it works really well. Uh, in the brain, progesterone is a, has an antidepressant, antipsychotic properties, and it, it's a mild painkiller. That's perfect for pregnant women, right? Mm -hmm. like, that's God's reward. This is going to keep you pregnant, but by the way, I'm also going to make you feel good, uh, not be crazy, and give you a little pain relief. <laughs> okay, but if you don't have enough, then you feel the effects of PMS. Okay. Um, this is just one study. I, I, there's dozens that support this. Elevated serum progesterone concentrations were associated with statistically significant reduction in breast cancer risk. Why would you want to take progesterone? We know it reduces your risk of breast cancer. It doesn't eliminate it, so you still need to get your mammograms, but it reduces your risk. Here's another study. This is a journal that every gynecologist reads. It's one of their favorite journals. Synthetic progesterone, which I showed you right there, that's what it looks like, stimulates proliferation of breast cancer cells. Why would you take that? That stimulates the growth of breast cancer cells. That's what this article said. Natural progesterone, which is this, what you make, alone or with estrogen, which you make, reduces the proliferation of breast cancer cells and induces cancer cell death. Why wouldn't you want to take that? That's not going to cause cancer. That's your own body. That's your own hormones. So these, these results, we see these over and over again. But what you hear is hormones are bad. Don't take that. Don't take that estrogen. Don't take that estrogen, man, because you, you were bleeding and you're in your 80s. You shouldn't be having vaginal bleeding. And I agree, she shouldn't be. But we were giving it to her to help her bones. And she wasn't stopping the bleeding, the bleeding continued because she didn't have progesterone to, to counter that. Yes, would that cause a problem? What's that? Would that cause a problem in the continual bleeding? Yeah, I mean, women obviously don't want to bleed, and if you bleed too much, then you can get anemic. Okay. But uh, uh, for any of us in medicine, postmenopausal bleeding, and a bleeding in a postmenopausal patient is uterine cancer until you prove that it's not. So then we have to we have to do a, an endometrial biopsy, and we have to get an ultrasound, and we have to maybe do a DNC. We get worried. Well, that's predictable. Too much estrogen isn't going to do that to you. This is a, a study in a neurobiology journal that basically just says, um, oops, this is, this is where they said that the progesterone um, possesses anti, uh, similar, uh, has similar metabolites to, as antipsychotic drugs. Haldol and clozapine. So it really, it really does help you feel like you're not going crazy. It makes you feel normal. It makes you feel good. Uh, this is a fertility and sterility journal. Hormone replacement therapy in young women is safe and effective 
preventing osteoporotic fractures. That's what I was trying to do for this lady. Preventing heart disease or reducing the risk of heart disease. Diabetes and dementia. You want to reduce your risk of dementia? Make sure your estrogen levels are optimal. Um, the, if we want to increase your risk of osteoporosis, women, and of heart disease, we could do a complete hysterectomy at 30 and wait 20 years and not replace your estrogen. Your risk of osteoporosis will go way up. Your risk of heart disease will go way up because estrogen is so important for the bones and the arteries. We don't want to do that, obviously. Progesterone displays favorable action on the vessels and on the brain, whereas the synthetic progestins don't do that. Your body has already got it figured out. You've been made perfectly. And these hormones are meant to be there for a reason. And you're not designed to be yanking stuff out just because there's a problem. What's the root cause of, uh, of, the, uh, of the vaginal bleeding? It's probably an estrogen imbalance. You don't have to do a hysterectomy. Take progesterone and balance the hormones and, and the fibroids will shrink. And if we balance this early enough, you'll never even have to get to that point. Natural progesterone confers no risk of breast cancer as opposed to the synthetic ones that do. This is just showing uh, you what happens uh, during a regular 28-day cycle. You have your period for three or four or five days. Then the 14th day, you ovulate. And the reason you ovulate is because the estrogen level goes up. When it peaks, it tells the ovary to release the egg. Okay, it's done its job, it drops back down. Then the body says, okay, now you need progesterone, because if you get pregnant, we want your body to know not to abort that baby. So the progesterone level goes up. But what if it doesn't go up? What if it stays down here? Well, if you've ever had PMS, you, you can tell me what happens, because that's when you need progesterone. All those symptoms of PMS, the headaches, the food cravings, the breast tenderness, the bloating, the, the weepy emotions, the irritable emotions, that's when you get them. And so you take as much progesterone as you need to not feel that way. Yes? So those uh, women who have had miscarriages, if they want to, after whatever, a few months, get pregnant again, would they start taking progesterone? Yeah. yeah in fact, uh, OBGYNs will often put them on, if, when they first get pregnant, they'll add progesterone to that as part of their therapy to keep them from miscarrying. Yeah. Mm hmm It is related to low hormone. Yes, it's usually related to not enough estrogen. The bloating, the, the belly fat that you guys get in menopause has nothing to do with your diet, nothing to do with your exercise, because that doesn't change from 40 to 50, right? You're not doing anything different. What's changed is you're not making estrogen anymore. With low estrogen, you'll, the belly fat will go on, and, and, and the bloating will also occur, so yeah and the headaches, and, and the progesterone can help with that too. Okay, so testosterone. This is what testosterone does for men and women both. Look, it, it lowers your cholesterol level, the bad cholesterol. It reduces blood clots. It gives you more energy, more bone mass. A guy today I was seeing, he'd been off his testosterone for a while, he goes, my knees and joints hurt. I said, yeah, you stopped your testosterone. I said, how were they when you took your testosterone? Oh, they were fine, I didn't have a problem. Then. You should probably go back to what you were doing. These are the deficiency symptoms. Um, it will help men lose their gut. Uh, at least it's a jump start. You'll lose a, a size on your, on your belt buckle. You go down a belt buckle. You get bigger up through your chest and arms, so the scales won't really reward you, but you'll change, you have more muscle and less fat. Look at that. Reduce risk of heart attacks and dementia. Uh, by taking testosterone. And women can take this too. You just take a smaller amount than men do. Okay. And when you ask your doctor to measure your testosterone levels, you don't want them to say, oh, you're in the normal range, you don't need testosterone. You don't want to be in the normal range. Do you know where this range comes from for men? 50 to 200, that's the f called the free testosterone. <coughs> that's from looking at, say, 1,000 men from the age of 18 to 90. Where do these guys fall? Now these are, these are Americans. How many American men would you say are really like perfectly fit and healthy? 
and that, that's where we're saying that the normal range is. So, uh, uh, so an 18 year old would have a free testosterone near 190, 200, and then a, you know, a 70 or 80 year old would be down by 50. So when the doctor tells you at 44, oh, you're in the normal range, you're fine, and your level's 52, do you, want, do you think that's good as a man? You don't want to be like an a, a 80 year old man with your testosterone level, you want to be like a, like a 30 year old man if you can't be. And then you'll start doing 30 year old kind of things. You'll feel better. And the same for women. So these are the levels for women. You don't want to be told, oh, everything's fine, you're normal. You want to be told, no, you're optimal. And when you're optimal, you'll feel better. You'll be more likely to go to the gym. Your libido probably will increase and you'll feel more vibrant, more active. Okay, so lower serum testosterone levels uh, and mortality. So when the testosterone levels are lower, it's associated with an increased risk of death over the following 20 years, independent of all the other risk factors. So just if we just take a man's testosterone level away for 20 years, he's more likely to die from all kinds of things. Uh, this is a, a correlation with testosterone and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, low concentrations uh, were, were seen in men with Alzheimer's disease. If you want to protect all, yourself from Alzheimer's, one thing you should do is optimize your testosterone. Prostate cancer, see this is where guys worry. Prostate cancer was present in uh, one out of seven biopsies of men with a normal prostate. So I still check the PSA closely because if it's not what I like, it's not really low, I keep watching it and investigating further, and I can find prostate cancer in normal PSAs. But what about prostate cancer and testosterone? There's an increased risk of cancer associated with low rates of testosterone. Isn't that interesting? So all you, the men that just have no testosterone, their risk, risk of prostate cancer goes up. You don't see a 25-year-old with high testosterone developing prostate cancer. You see old guys acting like old guys getting prostate cancer. Um, there's adverse effects of testosterone deficiency on body composition, insulin sensitivity, and systemic inflammation. If we knock your testosterone levels out, which we do when you have prostate cancer, you're gonna have more fat. Saw a guy today in the office, more belly fat. He knew it's because he's, he's knocked it out. You're more likely to develop diabetes and you're gonna have more inflammation. We can measure the inflammation. We shouldn't be doing that to guys. That's terrible. It's a terrible treatment approach because all they're doing is looking at the PSA, which is zero, and these guys don't wanna live anymore because there's no testosterone. They, don't, they, don't, they know they're not a woman, but they certainly don't feel like a man anymore. And they really fight depression. They have no energy, they're tired. Their quality of life is terrible. So if we, if we take away their testosterone levels, it will increase uh, their risk of heart disease. Testosterone is, is a good preventive measure for heart disease. Here's, uh, I need to try to move through this really quick here. In fact, I'll, I'll skip this, but this is a supplement that you can get. It's a steroid hormone with pr pretty much weak effects. I'm not sure you'll notice a lot if you take it, but it can help uh, maybe your brain fog, your energy a little bit, and it's, it's easy to get. But get a high quality one. Mako sells a high quality one that it's the same brand that I take. So women would take 10 to 20 milligrams, uh, and men would take 50 to 100 milligrams. Uh, let's see. This is talking about <clears throat> what happens if it's low. <coughs> you don't want that to be low either. Thyroid, I have to spend a little time on this because I apologize, but this is really important because a lot of you have questions or issues with your thyroid. Um, here's the deficiency symptoms. And the ones that really catch my attention are uh, hair loss, uh, brittle nails, and dry skin. If you have those three, you probably are low in thyroid. But these others, other symptoms are often seen in low thyroid. The reason it never gets corrected is because most doctors and endocrinologists measure the wrong hormone. They measure TSH and T4, and they're almost always normal. Your cells do not care what those levels are. Your cells are looking for T3. That's the active form of the thyroid. It's four times more active 
than T4. So you've got to have this. And if it's not measured, you're not going to see that. So we measured it with you guys. It should be above 3, at least above 3. If you're 2.5, your thyroid is too low. You're, you're not optimal. Oops. Um, okay, so yeah, here it is. Here's what I'm showing. Don't let anybody tell you that a, a, a free T3 level of 2.4 is normal. Because that's not normal. It's in the normal range, but you don't want to be in that range. Because I guarantee you probably have these symptoms. This is just showing you that uh, zinc and selenium supplementation can sometimes help you make the thyroid hormone better, but often it doesn't quite do enough. And this is kind of a busy slide. It's just kind of explaining this. Chapter 11, there's like two or three pages on thyroid. You can read through that. Hopefully that will make sense to you. But there's an enzyme that converts uh, T4 to T3. And that enzyme right here requires selenium and zinc. But it can be poisoned by lead, like Dr. Jacobowski was poisoning his with a bullet. It can be poisoned by cadmium and uh, by other, other head, heavy metals. It can be poisoned or ineffective if you eat too many sugars or too many carbs in your diet. So a lot of things can, over time, make that enzyme not work. Uh, this is just showing you that uh, low thyroid function was uh, positively associated with more risk for heart disease. Why would you want your thyroid levels to be low normal when that increases your risk of heart disease? Nobody knows this, I mean, unless you've been trained in hormones. And I, I mean, I, I don't want you to quote me when you go see your endocrinologist, because they hate me. They're like, what's this family doctor telling you? I'm telling you what the research says. I'm telling you what patients say and how they feel when they do this. But they, some of them tolerate me and some of them really don't like me. So don't use my name because I don't want them to have more reason to hate me. Okay, so this is more on thyroid. I'll skip through that. Melatonin is, is a, not a steroid hormone, but it is a, is a really important hormone that helps you sleep. So it, when you're young, you make a lot of it. And as you get older, it starts to decline. This is kind of cool because your body makes a natural sleeping aid. It's melatonin. Um, when you go outside in the sun and you get natural light in your eyes, you make melatonin from a little gland in the middle of your brain called the pineal gland. But how many of us were outside today? When we go out in the summertime, how many of us are wearing sunglasses? We're blocking that. So we're not making it very well as we get older. Then it gets released. It, it's released when natural light goes down. Have you noticed how tired we are at 7 o'clock now? Yeah. And in the summertime, we're like 9 o'clock, we're not even feeling the same thing. It's because the melatonin is being, has already been released two hours ago. But as we get older, we're making less and less of it. So for, for a lot of us, we can supplement with melatonin and take it at bedtime. It's the natural sleep aid. The problem is some of you won't have any response. Some of you will have really vivid dreams and not like it. Um, but I say try it. And if one milligram doesn't work, try three or five or ten. Uh, one milligram used to wipe me out all night until halfway through the next day. Now I can take three milligrams. Dr. Rousier, who teaches this, he takes 50 milligrams. And when he's flying across the other side of the world doing his conferences, he'll take 100. <laughs> like, that'd be hibernation mode for me. But uh, everybody has a different tolerance. OK, so we talked about these are the, I mean, I've kind of been through the course myself and applied this stuff. So I tried to burn some belly fat. Didn't work. I told you about this on the, you know, this is a picture my brother took. I was freezing cold in that pool. And I should have, you know, I should have been awake, middle of the afternoon, 47, 48 years old. I was sound asleep. You know, I think I was like probably drooling at this point. Ten minutes after I get out of the pool, and then my brother snaps this picture. So, you know, you can see the man boobs, the belly, the shoulders, all this stuff. So I started changing all this, and I started training pretty hard. And I would never show you a before picture without an after, because that would be embarrassing. <laughs> So the after picture changed. And I, I wasn't able to do this 10, 15 years ago. Whoops, not this. That. I couldn't do a wide grip pull up. I did four of those uh, Saturday after I worked out with Dylan, and he ripped out like 15 or 20. I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> 
so this is an excellent book. Dr. Rizzi is the doctor who is training thousands of doctors a year. If you, if you put him against your endocrinologist, they would be speechless because he would give them study after study after study to support what we're talking about. He defends doctors in court who do what I do, and the expert witnesses are the endocrinologist or whoever else. They just say, well, we all know this is what we're supposed to do, but where's the evidence? Well, they don't provide evidence. Dr. Ruzzi provides evidence. So he's, he's excellent, excellent. He's devoted his whole life to this. Here's a couple other books if you're interested in this. Um, these are all, uh, this guy's an endocrinologist here. He's a gynecologist and she's an internal medicine specialist and they've all heard Dr. Rousier teach. They all sort of kind of do the same things because they've seen the same research. So this week um, was supposed to have been last week because we were going to have you develop a he healthy eating plan for Thanksgiving, but we missed out on that opportunity. So I'm sure you all were not real good. And uh, the most important thing about last week was remembering how you felt Friday, how hungry you were, right? And why you were hungry. Insulin and ghrelin, okay. So I know I went over, but I, I think it's, it was just really important that we got that hormone discussion because it affects a lot of us. It's safe, it's effective, and you know, it can be anywhere from $50 to $150 a month to take these hormones, depending on where you get them and how much you take. Do um, you want to say anything, Kelly? I do, okay. yes. Um, next week, um, we have fire in the back, but next week we were asking if you could possibly come a little early. We want to get your measurements, your blood pressure, your BMI, uh, talk to you about what blood work you want at the end. And we'd still like to get started pretty close to the 5.30. So if you are able to and you can come a little early, that'd be great so we can get all that stuff done. Kelly, what time are we gonna be here? We're gonna be here at 4.30. So anytime from 4.30 on. Thanks, Deb. Okay. That's it. Anybody have any questions? I know we kept you over, but. Okay, yes. I don't have a question. I just wanna say that I do the hormones and I oh. one yeah. And I started off with the creams. I could tell the difference, so I switched over. I wear a patch, mm -hmm. uh, the estradiol, yeah. and um, the progesterone, the sublingual, I put on every time. Right, right. Um, at first, I was taking a patch once a week, but I could tell the difference towards the end of the week, so I switched to twice a week. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say, if you do want to try it, don't give up. If it doesn't work the first time, yeah. just try other things yeah. until something suits you. Yeah. Who, who's the provider you, that does um, that? Oh, and wow. Dr. Brandel. I didn't know there was another like bioidentical doctor there. Well, I started off with Jerry Marlowe. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Yeah, Jerry Dr. was into that. So, um, when I wanted to switch to something different, mm -hmm. uh, because the cream just, I could tell the difference yeah. from my batch to batch. So yeah. I didn't know what to do. I, I, yeah, that's great. I talked to him about it. He told me there's um, nurses up there that, yeah. that he. What I wouldn't recommend are the pellets. The, some people will insert pellets like testosterone or estrogen pellets under your skin. It's a big, it's a procedure, so they make a lot of money. But they often either under or overdose you, and you're stuck until that wears off. So you like shaving a beard and waiting for that to wear off. <laughs> so. I tried testosterone at the beginning, and it made me mean. Yes, it can so. do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you confirmed that huh. Did. Yeah. And I almost got in trouble at work and it was that bad. Yeah. And so I stopped. Yeah. So maybe I did. Usually no, with I testosterone, did. you have to experiment. Like maybe it's not every day, maybe it's two, two or three days a week because you don't want to feel that. That's too much if you're mean. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I just want to say that it's done really good for me. I don't have any problem sleeping and I'll be 61 in two weeks and I'm Excellent. still taking it. And the doctor recommends it for osteoporosis. Yeah, well. yeah, excellent. That's good to hear. I'm glad that there's somebody there that's doing that. All right, we'll see you guys. Oh, yes. I just have a question. On the um, estrogen side, the normal female, it has 50 to 300, uh -huh. and the optimal is 50 to 100. Yeah. Is that... The 50 to 300 is in women who are menstruating because it'll go up and it'll go oh, down. When, okay. you're, when you're ovulating, I think it's up around 300. Okay. But postmenopausal, you ideally you want it to be between 60 and 80, or 60 and 100 for most women. That's kind of the ideal range. But you always treat 
patients based on how they feel. So some women are a lot less than that. And insurance doesn't cover No. But you can get, the, like, the estrogen tablets are really cheap. So, Deb. Actually, my anthem pays for the estradiol. Yeah. They for the they did initially. Yeah. Yeah. The progesterone is all, always compounded, and that's always a little bit more. So is the testosterone if you take it. But a lot of women don't need testosterone. I should add to that. Um, I get my estradiol uh, using GoodRx. Mm -hmm. I don't send it through my insurance because it was more expensive. Mm -hmm. And it's probably, I don't know, $75, $80 for three months. Is that a tablet? You take a tablet? Or is that no, the cream? No, the estradiol is a patch. Oh, oh the patch. patch. Okay. Patch. Yeah. And then that's the good. sublingual I get from Bowling. Yeah, RC compounding. Yeah, they're really good. I think that's, I don't know, $35, $40 for three months. That's pretty good. Yeah. Your insurance normally will pay for the doctor visit and they'll pay for the blood work. Um, but the actual hormone replacement therapy, some insurances only pay a fraction of. But trust me, once you start doing it, you're, you don't care. You're going you're gonna to pay it. Because you feel that much better. Well, like I said, if you try the good RX, you actually get it cheaper than what you do through insurance. Nice. A lot cheaper. So, and, and what way do you feel a lot better? For me. In what way do you feel better? I sleep really well. Um, I don't have knee swings. Um, hot flashes? I, I don't have hot flashes. No, I don't. Vaginal dryness is really common. I don't have that. That, that goes away. Um, a lot of the urinary problems, the leaking when you cough or sneeze, or that urgency, unless you've, you've really you know, pushed big babies out and everything has dropped, your anatomy's changed, if you get enough estrogen, the, those bladder problems go away, which is pr pretty amazing <coughs> for a lot of women. So in the blood work that we can opt to get next week, are hormone levels in there? No. 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 T3 free is. Okay. Um, if you were concerned with your T3 free at the beginning, your thyroid test, um, you're welcome to get that retested for $10. Uh, the hemoglobin A1C, if you're a diabetic or concerned about being a diabetic and you'd like to have that rechecked, we can do that. And the CRP, which is the inflammation that we had, had checked, uh, you get the complete cholesterol panel free because it was part of what you originally paid. But those three tests are, are optional. Yes. So the T3, T3, whatever, free, that's the only one you need to test the hormone level, whatever? That's the only one your cells really care about. So, so like, you know, like lipid, lipid panel does the whole cholesterol thing. Mm -hmm. and so all you got to do is do this one. Okay. Yeah, but most health screen tests, community screens, they only check the TSH, and that's not really that helpful, but it's cheap. Okay. And melatonin, I have three milligram melatonin, but I only take it when I need it to get a good night's sleep for babysitting the next day, all day, or whatever, a big job. But the directions on there say you shouldn't take it no more than five days in a row. If you Melatonin to help you sleep at night. Go so, to the doctor. That, the, the logic there is your brain's only making melatonin five days a week. <laughs> 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 your brain is making it every night, you're just not getting enough. So, I don't, that doesn't make any sense. So, it's okay to take three milligrams, one milligram. As long as you're not having nightmares or you're not drowsy in the morning, yeah. All right, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Make sure you fill out your